Harry heard the hat shout the last word to the whole hall. He took off the hat and walked shakily towards the Gryffindor table. He was so relieved to have been chosen and not put in Slytherin, he hardly noticed that he was getting the loudest cheer yet. Percy the Prefect got up, shaking his hand vigorously, while the Weasley twins yelled, We got Potter! We got Potter! Harry sat down opposite the ghost in the rough he'd seen earlier. The ghost patted his arm, giving Harry the sudden horrible feeling he'd just plunged it into a bucket of ice-cold water. He could see the high table properly now. At the end nearest him sat Hagrid, who caught his eye and gave him a thumbs up. Harry grinned back, and there, in the centre of the high table, in a large gold chair, sat Albus Dumbledore. Harry recognised him one at once from the card he'd got out of the chocolate frog on the train. Dumbledore's silver hair was the only thing in the whole hall that shone as brightly as the ghosts. Harry spotted Professor Quirrell too, the nervous young man from the leaky cauldron. He was looking very peculiar in a large purple turban. And now there were only three people left to be sorted. Turpin, Lisa, became a Ravenclaw, and then it was Ron's turn. He was pale green by now. Harry crossed his fingers under the table, and a second later the hat had shouted, Gryffindor! Harry clapped loudly with the rest as Ron collapsed into the chair next to him. Well done, Ron. Excellent, said Percy Weasley pompously across Harry, as Zambini Blaze was made a Slytherin. Professor McGonagall rolled up her scroll and took the sorting hat away. Harry looked down at his empty gold plate. He'd only just realised how hungry he was. The pumpkin pasties seemed ages ago. Albus Dumbledore had got to his feet. He was beaming at the students. His arms opened wide, as if nothing could have pleased him more than to see them all there. Welcome, he said. Welcome to a new year at Hogwarts. Before we begin our banquet, I would like to say a few words. And here they are. Nitwit, blubber. Oddment, tweak. Thank you. He sat back down. Everybody clapped and cheered. Harry didn't know whether to laugh or not. Is he a bit mad? He asked Percy uncertainly. Mad, said Percy airily. He's a genius. Best wizard in the world. B but he is a bit mad, yes. Potatoes, Harry. Harry's mouth fell open. The dishes in front of him were now piled with food. He'd never seen so many things he liked to eat on one table. Roast beef, roast chicken, pork chops and lamb chops, sausages, bacon and steak, boiled potatoes, roast potatoes, chips, Yorkshire pudding, peas, carrots, gravy, ketchup and, for some strange reason, mint humbugs. The Dursleys had never exactly starved Harry, but he'd never been allowed to eat as much as he liked. Dudley had always taken anything that Harry really wanted, even if it made him sick. Harry piled his plate with a bit of everything except the humbugs and began to eat. It was all delicious. That does look good, said the ghost in the rough sadly, watching Harry cut up his steak. Can't you? I haven't eaten for nearly 400 years, said the ghost. I don't need to, of course, but one does miss it. I don't think I've introduced myself. Sir Nicholas de Mimsey Porpington at your service. Resident ghost of Gryffindor Tower. I know who you are, said Ron suddenly. My brother's told me about you. You're nearly Headless Nick. I would prefer you to call me Sir Nicholas de Mimsey. The ghost began stiffly, but sandy-haired Seamus Finnegan interrupted. Nearly headless? How could you be nearly headless? Sir Nicholas looked extremely miffed, as if their little chat wasn't going at all the way he wanted. Like this, he said irritably. He seized his left ear and pulled. His whole head swung off his neck and fell onto his shoulders, as if it was on a hinge. Someone had obviously tried to behead him, but not done it properly. Looking pleased at the stunned looks on their faces, nearly headless, Nick flipped his head back onto his neck, coughed, and said, So, new Gryffindors, I hope you're going to help us win the house championship this year. Gryffindor have gone so long without winning. Slytherin have got the cup six years in a row. The bloody Baron's becoming almost unbearable. He's the Slytherin ghost. 
Harry looked over at the Slytherin table and saw a horrible ghost sitting there, with blank staring eyes, a gaunt face and robes stained with silver blood. He was right next to Malfoy, who Harry was pleased to see didn't look too pleased with the seating arrangements. How did he get covered in blood? asked Seamus with great interest. I've never asked, said nearly headless Nick del delicately. When everyone had eaten so much, as much as they could, the remains of the food faded from the plates, leaving them sparkling clean as before. A moment later the puddings appeared. Blocks of ice cream in every flavour you could think of. Apple pies, treacle tarts, chocolate eclairs and jam donuts, trifles, strawberries, jelly rice, pudding. As Harry helped himself to a treacle tart, the talk turned to their families. I'm half and half, said Seamus. My dad's a muggle. Mam didn't tell him she wasn't a witch till after they were married. Bit of a nasty shock for him. The others laughed. What about you, Neville? said Ron. Well, my gran brought me up and she's a witch, said Neville. But the family thought I was all muggle for ages. My great uncle, Algie, kept trying to catch me off my guard and force some magic out of me. He pushed me off the end of Blackpool Pier once. I nearly drowned. But nothing happened until I was eight. Great uncle Algie came round for tea and he was hanging me out of an upstairs window by the ankles when my great aunt Auntie Enid offered him a meringue and he accidentally let go. But I bounced all the way down the garden and into the road. They were all really pleased. Gran was crying, she was so happy. And you should have seen their faces when I got in here. They thought I might not be magic enough to come, you see. Great uncle Algie was so pleased he bought me my toad. On Harry's other side, Percy Weasley and Hermione were talking about lessons. I do hope they start straight away. There's so much to learn. I'm particularly interested in transfiguration, you know, turning something into something else. Of course, it's supposed to be very difficult. You'll be starting small, just matches into needles and that sort of thing. Harry, who was starting to feel warm and sleepy, looked up at the high table again. Hagrid was drinking deeply from his goblet. Professor McGonagall was talking to Professor Dumbledore. Professor Quirrell, in his absurd turban, was talking to a teacher with greasy black hair, a hooked nose and sallow skin. It happened very suddenly. The hooked-nosed teacher looked past Quirrell's turban straight into Harry's eyes, and a sharp, hot pain shot across the scar on Harry's forehead. Ouch! Harry clapped a hand to his head. What is it? asked Percy. N nothing. The pain had gone as quickly as it had come. Harder to shake off was the feeling Harry had got from the teacher's look. A feeling that he didn't like Harry at all. Who's that teacher talking to Professor Quirrell? he asked Percy. Oh, you know Quirrell already, do you? No wonder he's looking so nervous. That's Professor Snape. He teaches potions, but he doesn't want to. Everyone knows he's after Quirrell's job. He knows an awful lot about the dark arts, Snape. Harry watched Snape for a while, but Snape didn't look at him again. At last the puddings too disappeared, and Professor Dumbledore got to his feet again. The hall fell silent. Ahem. <clears throat> Just a few words now. We are all fed and watered. I have a few start of term notices to give you. First years should note that the forest in the grounds is forbidden to all pupils. And a few of our older students would do well to remember that as well. Dumbledore's twinkling eyes flashed in the direction of the Weasley twins. I've also been asked by Mr Filch, the caretaker, to remind you all that no magic should be used between classes in the corridors. Quidditch trials will be held in the second week of term. Anyone interested in playing with their ha for the house teams should contact Madam Hooch. And finally... I must tell you that this year the third floor corridor on the right hand side is out of bounds to everyone who does not wish to die a very painful death. Harry laughed. He was one of the few that did. He's not serious, he muttered to Percy. Must be, said Percy, frowning at Dumbledore. It's odd because he usually gives us a reason why we're not allowed to go somewhere. The forest's full of dangerous beasts, everyone knows that. I do think he might have told us prefects, at least. And now, before we go to bed, let us sing the school song, cried Dumbledore. 
Harry noticed that the other teacher's smiles had become rather fixed. Dumbledore gave his wand a little flick, as if he was trying to get a fly off the end, and a long golden ribbon flew out of it, which rose high above the tables and twisted itself, snake-like, into words. Everyone pick their favourite tune, Dumbledore said, and off we go. And the school bellowed. Hogwarts, Hogwarts, Hoggy, Warty Hogwarts. Warts, teach us something please Whether we be old and bold or young with scabby knees Our heads could do with filling with some interesting stuff For now they're bare and full of air, dead flies and bits of fluff So teach us things worth knowing, bring back what we forgot Just do your best, we'll do the rest and learn until our brains all rot Everybody finished the song at different times At last, only the Weasley twins were left singing along to a very slow funeral march. Dumbledore conducted their last few lines with his wand, and when they'd finished, he was one of those who clapped loudest. Ah, music, he said, wiping his eyes. The magic beyond all we do here. And now, bedtime. Off you trot. The Gryffindor first years followed Percy through the chattering crowds, out of the great hall and up the marble staircase. How his legs were like lead again. But only because he was so tired and full of food. He was too sleepy even to be surprised that the people in the portraits along the corridors whispered and pointed as they passed, or that twice Percy led them through doorways hidden behind sliding panels and hanging tapestries. They climbed more staircases, yawning and dragging their feet. Harry was just wondering how much further they had to go when they came to a sudden halt. A bundle of walking sticks was floating in mid-air ahead of them, and as Percy took a step towards them, they started throwing themselves at him. Peeves, Percy whispered to the first years, a poltergeist. He raised his voice. Peeves, show yourself. A loud, rude sound, like the air being let out of a balloon, answered. Do you want me to go to the bloody Baron? There was a pop, and a little man, with wicked dark eyes, and a wide mouth appeared, floating cross-legged in the air, clutching the walking sticks. Ooh, he said with an evil cackle. Ickle thirsties, what fun. He swooped suddenly at them. They all ducked. Go away, Peeves, or the Baron will hear about this. I mean it, barked Percy. Peeves stuck out his tongue and vanished, dropping the walking sticks on Neville's head. They heard him zooming away, rattling coats of armour as he passed. You want to watch out for Peeves? said Percy, as they set off again. The bloody Baron's the only one who can control him. He won't even listen to us prefects. Here we are. At the very end of the corridor hung a portrait of a very fat woman in a pink silk dress. Password, she said. Caput Draconis, said Percy, and the portrait swung forward to reveal a round hole in the wall. They all scrambled through it. Neville needed a leg up and found themselves in the Gryffindor common room, a cosy, round room full of squashy armchairs. Percy directed the girls through the door to their dormitory and the boys through another. At the top of the spiral staircase, they were obviously in one of the towers, they found their beds at last. Five, four posters hung with deep red velvet curtains. Their trunks had already been brought up. Too tired to talk much, they pulled on their pyjamas and fell into bed. Great food, isn't it? Ron muttered to Harry through the hangings. Get off, Scabbers. He's chewing my sheets. Harry was going to ask Ron if he'd had any of the treacle tart, but he fell asleep almost at once. Perhaps Harry had eaten a bit too much because he had a very strange dream. He was wearing Professor Quirrell's turban, which kept talking to him, telling him he must transfer to Slytherin at once because it was his destiny. Harry told the turban he didn't want to be in Slytherin. It got heavier and heavier. He tried to pull it off, but it tightened painfully. And there was Malfoy laughing at him as he struggled with it. Then Malfoy turned into the hook-nosed teacher, Snape, whose laugh became high and cold. There was a burst of green light, and Harry woke, sweating and shaking. He rolled over and fell asleep again. And when he woke next day, he didn't remember the dream 